thanks for coming, um, Anthony. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I think everyone knows about the Grab Taxi, so we can save the introduction. Um, yeah, so let's just go straight. Like, uh, I'm actually very, very curious because, like, on on TechList, we actually found out that uh, Grab Taxi is founded by two co-founders, right? So, but right now it's primarily led by you. So, yeah. what happened between you and your co-founder? What is the story behind it? Well, I uh, I chased her out. Uh, I couldn't stand her. No, no. Um, she was actually a uh, she was bonded by McKinsey. So we were poor, very poor. Uh, couldn't afford to break a bond. Uh, so she had to go back to the valley, uh, and she went back to McKinsey. And thank God. After that, uh, we had someone else who helped break a bond. Salesforce broke a bond for her, and she joined Salesforce. And then afterwards, uh, we, through time, a little bit more time, uh, we actually convinced her to come back. So she has rejoined us uh, to head all our new expansion, uh, Hui Ling, and uh, she's back with us. Uh, besides her, of course, we brought a lot more new people. Uh, Arul, who's there, uh, from Amazon, he used to hit all Amazon uh, mobile, and he's back with us. Uh, we have Kevin from Palantir, he used to hit Asia Pack Palantir. So we're just bringing a lot of people, whether old or new, back from the States. I see. Yeah, um, so Grab Taxi was founded in June 2012, right? So it's almost three years. So like go way back in front, like uh, what actually inspired you to start the business? Like just quick, just briefly. Inspired us yeah. to start a business? Why Grab Taxi? Well, it was quite simple. Um, one, Malaysia Taxi was a mess. Uh, that really helps. Um, the second, the taxi drivers weren't making money. Uh, drivers in general hated their jobs. Uh, women couldn't go around safely anywhere. Everybody, you know, I wouldn't put my fiance uh, in, in a taxi. I would, I would be extremely afraid. I think uh, Hui Ling, my co-founder, when she finished work at 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. in McKinsey, she would jump on her phone, uh, pretend to talk to the mother while the driver was driving, uh, whether it was even a nice car that was arranged by McKinsey, and she was just afraid the whole time. So I think that real need that we can really make a difference in people's lives, uh, women especially, safely. So today, you know, we are very very, very humble to say we transport you know, 300,000 people a day, right? We really improve the lives of drivers. They make 30 to 300% more take-home pay every day, right? Seven bookings every second, right? So these are the things that I think it really helps us, um, that reinvigorates us, that we solved a real problem. So actually, we pulled out our business plan competition deck and we checked it and we said, holy cow, from the pictures to, the, it was called My Taxi then, and still called My Taxi in Malaysia. And it's exactly the same till today. So really we were focused on these two problems and we aimed it and we solved part of it, not all of it, but part of it. <laughs> um, that is really interesting. Like, uh, and you know, drivers, they are not the most tech savvy people on earth, right? And then uh, you, you mentioned that they're dangerous, sadly. So how, how do you even like go about like solving this problem? Because like a lot of people, you know, they, they see your company as like a technology company, right? But you have to deal with like real people, like drivers. So how, how do you start in 2012, like basically acquiring your first driver and basically educating them, like how to use Grab Taxi and how not to be an asshole? Yeah, how do you even start? Well, it was tough. Uh, they were clueless, they were old, you know, all the old, old uncles, ayah, big kwan deo la, cannot see la, you know, the app, they just didn't understand it, they were so jaded by the world, right? They, every government rolls out some interesting taxi program for them and they usually get screwed, right? So they're like, look, I'm, I'm jaded by the world, uh, I don't understand technology, most of them are old uncles, whether in Malaysia or Singapore, or many other countries, or just people who are not educated. So jaded plus uneducated and completely apprehensive. So when we first started, we had to go fleet to fleet, driver to driver. We, stand, we stood, uh, until today, we stand outside, whether it's airport, whether it's 
shopping malls, taxi lines, going window by window and just knocking window by window. I did it too uh, in the hot sun by gas stations. And we just literally go, uncle, uh, let us try la, try la, try la. You know, it was very, and then of course we, we had, you know, of course through time we learned how to scale, right? Uh, we had three people do it. So one person will come, you know, especially at certain airports, they can only line up very quickly. So we had one person sign up, one person take over his phone, one person convince him. So within something like 30 seconds, he signed up, right? So we could still scale, but really understanding what their problems were, understanding how to do it. And now when we reach a certain size, now drivers come to us, but still we emphasize on, it has to be face to face because we need to make sure, is your house address correct with your IC? Is your face the, the right app face, right? The same, everything, because safety is critical to this business. It's critical to our brand. So we have to still, although it can scale, we still have to make sure it's face to face. Still today, whenever any of our 500 people sign up drivers, we'd still do it face to face. I think um, a lot of like, you know, especially technology founders, right? Uh, young people like us, uh, they, when, when they want to acquire users, they, the, the first thing that they think about is like, oh, like, I would just go to Facebook and then would just like target the drivers on Facebook, like do advertising and things like that. So one thing that, that I learned at YC is like just do things that don't scale. And to be honest, like that is something where like, mm, it's like simple, but at the same time, a lot of people are not doing. So I'm really interested to find out like, like how do you even like get started to, like what is the mindset behind like, okay, I, I, okay like all of a sudden like, I have to talk to drivers and then acquire them like one by one. Yeah, and then at, at the same time teaching them like how to make the road safe and everything. Like what is the mindset behind like doing things that don't scale for you? Yeah, I, the, the sexy terms, right? Viral, like what Kylie just mentioned, growth hacking, all that. It sounds sexy, very fluffy, um, but it, you just got to go back to the real stuff, right? So we knew, for example, taxi drivers in Singapore hang out in Bukit Merah, the Kopitiam, right? So we go hang out in the Kopitiam and hang out with them, right? Um, I, I think a lot of it is understanding, you know, I know it's super trite, but going back to the basics of where does your customer, so they pay us, right? Every job they pay us. You need to understand. So for example, for me, you know, every quarter, my fiance and I will go on a Sunday and go pick up passengers, right? Feel the lives, uh, I mean, we spend after church, we go and pick up people, right? And understand what problems we are solving for them, understand how it feels to press on, the, to play with the driver app, right? Understand, and then certain Sundays when she teaches at Sunday school, I, I go into the call center and pick up and, and work as a call center agent and talk to customers, right? I think these are things that you can't scale, obviously, because you know, I only have so many hours, but when you feel the problem, you know, it is a very typical Japanese principle, sangen shugi. It means feel the problem, see the problem, fix it yourself. When you, I think when that happens and your teammates, your fellow brothers and sisters, they feel that you understand your problem and the drivers feel your pain and you know, and they know you feel their pain, and your call center agents know you feel their pain, then everybody just comes together, alignment, and then it scales. I see. So drivers is just like one part of your business, right? And then you have the, basically your, your, the real customers that, that pay for, for, for the rights. So on the other end of the, the marketplace, like how do you start like acquiring the first users? Because back in 2012, like uh, Uber is not even in, in Southeast Asia, right? So you have, so how do you even like tell users that, hey, you know, it's like your smart, on your smartphone, you can actually download the app and then like use Grab Taxi. How do you like acquire your first user? Well, launch in KL first where taxis were shit show. Um, that really helped. Uh, the first day we launched uh, 11,000 downloads, oh, wow. right? Um, and we had, 160 taxis. So that's, so I think you need to make sure, you can do all kinds of fancy marketing stuff, but you really need to fix a problem. So KL had a problem, right? Manila has a problem. All these cities, Singapore, just trying to get a taxi, 6 p.m., you know, it, it's raining outside, 
it's a problem, right? And I think when you launch a real solution to a real problem, the take up naturally happens. I see. So basically, for, for users who download the app, uh, it's pretty natural, right? So the, the toughest part is basically acquiring drivers on the platform. In the beginning, yes. And, and then now that Grab Taxi is in 21, 22 cities, uh, you, you actually see drivers coming to the office and signing up on their own. Okay. Um, so I think a lot of people, when they look at Grab Taxi and they read Tech in Asia, right, and then they say, oh, wow, it's like Anthony, you know, the company is less than three years old, you raise like a, like a, a lot of money, like hundreds of million. So I really wanted to like, you know, put that aside and then talk about like the past. Before you, be, you raise your first round of financing, like, are there any low points that you basically face? What's the shittiest moment that you face in a company? Wow, um, there are a lot of shitty moments. Don't cry, uh, but, but do share with uh, us. So I remember there was once um, in Manila, we, after KL we launched in Manila, we couldn't pay salaries one month. Um, uh, our early guys um, got their salaries late. And they didn't even, because they were so close to us, they didn't even voice it. Um, we didn't even know until it was like a month later. So it was really, that was a huge wake up call for us. Uh, we were like, we thought everything was fine. We thought we planned well, but we didn't. We didn't plan well, we didn't spend well. We just weren't very smart. And we, it really, it was a reality check, right? That. Uh, that pushed us, but it pushed us to raise our first series uh, with with Vertex, uh, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Temasek, and they and they've been great since. So I think these type of calamities, these type of grab your shoulder, shake the heck out of you, a wake up calls, and you're like, holy cow, I can't afford to pay salaries. Those moments are like, holy cow, I gotta fix this. If I don't. We're done. So basically, you you ran out of cash, right? It was that, that was like the Manila story, and 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 how do you fix it? Because it, it takes time to to raise money, right? Like on average, like two to three months. So like in between, how do you fill up the gap? So the good news was our early guys were all compassionate, so I'm very thankful for that. So they let us drag. The second thing was uh, a lot of our directors. We just you know, broke our piggy banks and got whatever we had and shoved it into the business. And we knew we had to survive or we had no choice. It was just lack of planning, lack of understanding of how to use the cash. So I encourage you guys for any real hardcore startups, really just, you, you need to keep track of your cash balance like daily, especially when you have a million or two. That is really interesting. So you mentioned about like cash flow management. You, you, you had that problem. So what, what, exactly, what, is it, what exactly is that problem, if you don't mind sharing with us? I think just you want to grow, you want to grow, you want to grow, right? You want to monetize. You have all these conflicting agendas in your head as a CEO. And then, of course, your teammates are giving you different feedback. And then your, you know, whether you're investors or no investors or just your own or even you know, your parents or whoever, or banks or loans or whatever, your stakeholders are all giving you this feedback. I think you just need to understand no cash, no business, right? Period. There's no two ways about it. So you just got to make sure, one, keep track obsessively of the cash balance. Two, spend, I'm, I'm not going to say spend wisely. It's really about understanding like so for example, you know, people will say, Anthony, are you crazy building, you know, yes, you've raised a few hundred million, uh, but are you crazy to build a hundred million dollar engineering center, right? For us, it was not about, to us, that's much better than spending, I'm sorry to, you know, Facebook and Google guys out there, hundred million on, on those platforms because it's, it's, it's really spending a lot on user acquisition, but you want to build a real product. A real product means you need real engineers, you need real data scientists, you need real hardcore talent, people that are much smarter than me, 10x, right? And you need to build a facility and a culture that can digest, engulf, make them feel part of Grab family 
And when they can engulf that type of top talent, then that's, to me, why spending. Okay. So you raised uh, hundreds of millions, and uh, I'm pretty sure like, up to today, you still make like, a lot of mistakes, uh, because I do like, a fuck ton of mistakes as well. So uh, can you just name like, like three big mistakes that, that you would definitely like to share with entrepreneurs here, and hopefully they don't repeat the mistakes? I think one was hire wrongly. Um, that's super painful. Um, so there was once we hired wrongly, just a few months, we discovered it. Uh, it's going to be in the HR courts. Uh, we're going to fight it for years. It's probably going to cost me millions. Um, but, you know, we basically have to make a case of a martyr of this person uh, just to set an example, right? It's really about knowing we know what we did. We know we are right and standing by it, and even if it means, and we got the board approval to spend millions, so we can pay this guy, you know, X hundred thousands, but spending millions versus paying a hundred thousand, or two hundred, or three hundred, or four hundred thousand, makes more sense in this case, because it sends the message throughout all our Grab family, to know, guys, stand for what is right, even if it, it's more costly, right? So that's, I think, the first thing. The second is really spending time with people. I think there was once I was spending more and more time with the investor base, uh, a lot of you know, tech in Asia talks. Um, I Come think on, <laughs> it's good, it's fun. <laughs> I, I think a lot of times um, the people need the one-on-ones, right? Just time to understand they join you you know, Willis, they join you because you are the founder, you're the CEO, you're the blogger, right? Uh, as, as Ray correctly said, I'm just the chief of emails. That's, that's my job. That's all I do, right? So these guys join you in the fight. They deserve, you know, 30 minutes a week, right? Um, and I think, or bi-weekly, whatever you can afford, mm, depends on how many direct reports you have, but spending time to align, align, align. I think I didn't spend it as the company grew so fast, right? Well, hundreds and hundreds of people in 21, 22 cities aligning and not even having a base, right? We have so many offices. How do you keep everyone aligned on the same drum, right? How do you align everyone on the same priorities? How do you make sure that the respect, the humility, the values are kept consistent from me all the way down to the person who opens the door, right, to the drivers. How do you align that? It's very, very tough, right? So we created cadence of meetings. We created uh, very clear communications. We created ways in which I travel three to five countries a week, go down to the office, talk to the people on the ground, right? So it's, it's a lot. It's 10 flights a week, but it's a necessary. People are like, oh, Anthony, maybe you're not so smart. Maybe you... you don't know how to scale. Maybe you don't need to fly. Maybe you don't plan your time out. Maybe they're right. But for now, this has worked. Flying down, talking to them, giving them face time, that has worked. So I think spending time and really thinking about how to spend wisely. Um, so you're definitely, I think everyone would, would agree that you're one of the more successful founders, like at least in the last like uh, five years in Southeast Asia. So at the same time, you, you graduated from Harvard, you, you, you spent time in the US. So um, it could be coincidental that you, you know, like a Harvard grad, you know, get back to Southeast Asia, build a, like a freaking big company. I really want to understand like, uh, has your Harvard education or like, your, like you leaving it in the US impact any of your, you know, building Grab Taxi into like a really good company or a really big company? First of all, all we've shown is some traction. That, that's all. It's not very humble. No, no, it's a fact. It's a fact. Um, second, I think Harvard is a great institution. Um, I'm very grateful that they gave me the opportunity to study there. But it's just one part, right? I think um, having an extremely supportive fiance who understands, you know, to Kylie's point, it's extremely hard to understand why somebody has to travel 10 flights a week, right? and fly with me and go on my grab bike in Vietnam just to experience and talk to the driver, right, in Vietnamese, uh, with me side by side. Uh, no, it's one bike, one person, not two people <laughs> on one bike. So uh, yeah, I think that third, 
I think having an uh, incredible team. Um, the the team, you know, some of them are my Harvard classmates. Uh, Hui Ling, my co-founder. Uh, we have other Harvard classmates as well who's joined us. But it's, I would say more importantly, it's our faith in God, right? That we all, a lot of us, all whether whatever religion, whatever you believe in, but believing that we need to, you know, we, we have this principle, right? Um, your problem is my problem. We have this principle, grab family. We have this pr principle of, you know, happy driver, happy passenger, good, you know, it, it's like happy wife, happy life, right? And, and I think you need to understand that when you are, when your people feel that there is a, this greater extra sort of metaphysical, everyone feels that we're aligned because we're doing this for mission. We're doing this because of a greater good. When people feel that, holy cow, if, you know, if, for example, you know, Arul's here and the system breaks down, you know, 300,000 people don't get transported. He feels bad, right? Um, you know, people want to know that they are doing something that's greater than them, especially top talent, right? They, they have 50 offers at any point of time, right? And I think knowing that you can bring a team, having, as I said, uh, whether it's your Harvard classmates or classmates from other schools, but having everyone come together in with one alignment in terms of social values, in terms of your values, align on a greater good, knowing they're doing something that they can be proud of. That when he goes home to talk to his children, he's like, you know, I've had a tough day, I've worked 15 hours, but I know I've helped people. Right? That brings people together. Yeah, you keep mentioning about, I, I like that you keep mentioning about like uh, Grab Family. So uh, your company is like less than, it's like slightly less than three years old. And uh, I think you, are, you have like about 500 people in the, co in the company. And I really want to understand like, because you, you basically, your 500 people are, are across Southeast Asia. And it's only three years old, it's a pretty young company. How do you basically like first like set up a very good culture uh, uh, in KL and then from there spread across Southeast Asia? How, how do you manage to spread that culture and make sure that it's like deep within 500 people? One, pray like hell. <laughs> seriously uh, to have people 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 uh, really I cannot overemphasize that highest ROI is people really hire people who are smarter than you faster than you sharper than you who but still humble and give you feedback with mutual respect right and they can take constructive feedback I think those two things really really took us um, third was I think when we when we scaled you know, right after KL, it was Manila. After Manila, it was uh, it was uh, JB. After JB, I think it was another city. So I think allowing ourselves to go out uh, with a strong regional team and hiring the best local talent, let us combine it to become hyper relevant. Right? That really helped us grow so fast and became we became relevant in every city because of the top local people, with top regional people, brainstorming, joint ownership together to come up with a solution. Okay. Just one last question, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about this. Like, uh, you basically started like Grab Taxi alone. I, I, would, I would take it as like a sole founder. I mean, of course you have co-founder, but basically you, you set it up yourself, right? So how do you manage? Because you need to, number one, like hire, make sure that there's cash in the bank, communicate both internally and externally, work on the product, work on engineering. So how do you prioritize your time? 50% on people. So spending time filtering, spending time hiring, spending time interviewing, spending time with your people. The other 25% spending time with your existing people. So that's 75% of your time. Um, you know, 25% on, on emails. <laughs> so I would say, I think a big part is really, it's, it's a, I mean, the, the soul of the company is people. So you got to, uh, a, very, a very good distinguished engineer from uh, Microsoft recently told me, you know, it's what is core and non-core? Core is the people that affects your business. So when you become a certain size, say 500, 600 people, whatever, you will realize you're spending time on all the non-core crap. Don't spend time on the non-core crap. Go back, always remind yourself, Who's paying me? 
riders are paying me, spend time with them. Who's paying me? Drivers are, uh, are paying me, spend time with them. My people are driving the company, spend time with them. That's how I think about it. So up to today, you, you still talk to users? All the time, man. Every weekend, I'm either I talk to taxi drivers or grab car drivers, grab bike drivers. Every country I go to, I use our own service, talking to drivers. Most of the time, they have no idea. It's, they think it's uh, just whatever. And I just spend time with them. I, how I wish I could like, just talk to you like forever. But too bad, like, we have no more time. So thank you a lot, Anthony. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys.